Um, our next speaker is Claudio. And he's actually now for the third time, I think, in this workshop. And actually two years ago uh, in Montreal, he introduced IQ Real for the first time in our workshop, which was a huge honor for us. He's the he's the director of the Dynamic Legged Systems Lab at IIT in Italy. And he became famous with all his effort that he put in in his quadrupeds that he built over a long time. Um, what's maybe special to the, all the other quadrupeds presented in this workshop is that it's um, hydraulically actuated. So the stage is yours, Claudio. If you want, you can now start presenting. Okay, thanks a lot, Marco. Let me optimize for a video clip. Okay. Good. Can you see my screen? Yes. Let me put in full screen. <clears throat> okay, thanks a lot, Marco, for the introduction and for giving me the opportunity again to speak in this um, very nice workshop, very interesting workshop series. So today I will talk about novel methods for quadruped, quadruped locomotion over rough terrain, and I will also give you a short overview of our work with this uh, telemanipulation device. So for those that don't know me, um, I'm the head of the Dynamic Light Systems Lab of the IIT in Genoa in Italy. My lab has, uh, we have been doing research for the last 14 years in quadruped robots, not just the design of the machine, but a lot of research goes also into the control, the planning algorithm, the perception in general, making these um, a bit heavier robots move dynamically on rough terrain. And as you see here, I added the weight. We have 90 kilos, 80 kilos, and then 140 kilos in the most recent version, IQ Real, and we'll see a little bit more about these robots. So as Marco said, in the last two workshops, I actually uh, had a look at what I presented. First, uh, it was the plane pulling of IQ Real on the top left. And then um, we have also presented uh, Shamil's work on soft, um, um, soft ground, soft terrain walking stance, and then also shin uh, collision detection and, and, and coping with that correctly, and also some nice balancing, including this ninja walk that I presented last year. But um, I'm not sure if you can also see this uh, up bar, maybe not. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll go on. Um, so I have um, the, the, the first project I would like to introduce is the Robot Teleoperativo. This uh, project is a, a, is a, a collaboration between IIT and ENIL, ENIL is the um, National Insurance Against Accidents at Work. So they're interested in getting the workers out of uh, harm's way. And this includes three teams inside uh, IIT, the Advanced Robotics um, um, uh, Research Line of Darwin Caldwell, Humanoids and Human Centered Mechatronics of Nikos Tagarakis and my own lab, the Dynamic Light Systems Lab. This project has started about three years ago, three and a half years ago has then concluded its first phase in, in December and is now entering the second phase. And the project manager is Nikhil Deshpande. So I'll give you a quick overview of, um, now my slides are frozen. Maybe you can reshare. Oh wait, I can use these buttons here. All right. Um, so the Italian fire, firefighters are our end users in this project. So we had several meetings with them to understand what is it that they really need in a teleoperated robot? What kind of operations would they want to have uh, teleoperated to keep themselves out of harm's way? And so we projected this um, teleoperation uh, concept in which the, the, the fireman can, can be the one that is actually teleoperating. He has a a hand exoskeleton in is wearing a hand exoskeleton and can uh, teleoperate with a virtual reality interface um, a quadruped robot with an arm mounted on top so this is the early concept back in 2017 and now we have this uh, field robot on the left that combines an electric arm with our hydraulic quadruped and on the right we have a pilot station that i will explain a little bit more soon. But first about the field robot. So this is the electric arm that the team of Nikos Tagarakis uh, developed, custom 
made for, for this project. It's a very lightweight arm. It weighs only eight kilos, has a payload of five kilos. Um, the hand itself is, is, is two kilos. So then if we add the hand, we have three kilo of payload left. It's a very uh, a rugged arm as well. And the workspace has been optimized that it can pick up objects from the ground. It can operate in front of the robot when it's mounted on the robot to um, manipulate valves or open doors or whatever it needs to do. And the arm can also stow it to the back all the way so that if it's not used, it can then have a better um, um, distributed weight on, on the torso when it's doing the rough terrain locomotion. The hairy hand is the uh, second version of the hand developed also in the team of Nikos Zagarakis. This hand is very robust and powerful. It has four fingers and in integrated pressure sensing, visual feedback, and you see a little bit out of this camera view. So together, mounted the arm on top of the quadruped. Here we have an example where the arm is stowed to the back. On the left, you can see the robot is climbing up a few steps. It's almost falling here, but because there are uh, unstable rocks put there, the robot doesn't see it. So this is a, a haptic uh, walking with reactions here so that it doesn't slip, doesn't, doesn't fall down. And on the right side, you see some um, walking on these uh, random uh, rocks in, in, in our uh, playground in the back of IIT. So let me talk a little bit now about the uh, pilot station. This has the hand exoskeleton and the, and the force feedback device and the 3D virtual rea reality immersive interface. And I understand if I click on the zoom. Okay. Um, so I was uh, gonna talk about this, this pilot station. Here on the left side, you see two versions of the Hexatrack hand exoskeleton, which are also financed by some uh, two EU projects, uh, Warehub and, and Softbots. And you see in the video on the bottom left that Anais is very intuitively picking up um, uh, a random op 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 object here with the uh, cook arm that is mounting a, an IIT PISA soft hand. And you can see the hand exoskeleton can measure the six degree of freedom um, uh, position and orientation of the fingertips and can give up to 10 Newton feedback, force feedback in both extension and flexion into the finger. On the right side, we see the uh, force feedback device, a remote arm that has been developed by the team of, of Yanis Sarakoglu. And this one can render up to 20 Newtons in X, Y, Z to give the hand itself on the wrist uh, a feel of, of what is happening with the environment. So putting this together with the arm that we saw before on a, on a, on a bench test, um, this is during the Maker Fair in Rome. You see on the left, Yanis is playing with this cup that he can pick up this um, tennis ball quite nicely. And on the right, you see Enrico and the guys are, are catching balls that are thrown into the cup. This works really nicely. So this is on the side of the manipulation. Then the operator is, is wearing this uh, visor 3D um, augmented and virtual reality here, for example, on the left. You can see a virtual reality teleporting application where the operator can change its point of view to, to get to a better orient, better position to, to see in the 3D world or in the virtual world what is happening and the, his motion get, gets mapped to this new point of view. On the right side, you see uh, augmented reality. You see the different camera views that the operator is um, seeing here. But I'd like to move forward to show you how this works all together. In the back, you see the operator. It doesn't have a, a, a line of sight directed to the robot because it's wearing the visor, but you see that the hand and the arm push this plastic protection there and the strong fingers can pull it off so that um, this uh, fire hose can be gradually ex uh, extracted here with the finger. You see on the right side, the, the camera view that allows the finger to uh, go in. Then once the nozzle is out, it, it's re-grasping to get the, that nozzle out. And this one here is a task where the operator is opening the door and then pushing open, push, push open the door so that the robot can walk through. This was last December in a, in a demo we had for uh, our funding agency, Enil. It was a, a virtual demo. And this was a few months earlier. This is um, how precious objects can be retrieved, for example, um, in an in a earthquake struck house where the owners can't go back in because it's too dangerous, but there's still valuables in there, like um, a precious uh, jewelry or, or, or watch or, or I don't know. 
uh, pictures and, and this is a task that firemen sometimes need to do as well. So this um, are the credits. If you're interested in knowing more about this project, there's a website, but also I gave a talk on Monday uh, about this with a little bit more detail than what I managed to show uh, today. So this was just a, a glimpse into the wor work on, we do on telemanipulation on the, on the quadruped. Now I would like to shift gears and go into uh, planning and control of, of, of uh, quadrupeds. Here we have three very fresh new works for my team and I would like to introduce them um, for the first time here, this is uh, Vital. This is work by, by Shamel Fami, one of the organizers of the workshop today. Um, here it's about vision-based um, locomotion planning. So we want to here decouple the plans, the motion plans for the feet and the base. And we want to use the, the terrain perception, the environment, and uh, mapped with the robot skills to create these plans. But let's look a little bit into the past. We've been working on these kind of approaches for a while. This is the vision-based foot adaptation that uh, in 2015, Victor Baraswal has presented here. This uses a simple neural network. And here the goal is to select footholds uh, based on the terrain information and based on the robot capabilities. So in this case, on the top in the video, you see the robot is stepping over these uh, wooden bars. And, and um, I'll show you a video how this is done in 2019 when Octavio Villarreal uh, from, from my team also used better evaluation criteria and the self-supervised uh, convolutional neural network to uh, improve up on this. And, and uh, in, in 2020, last year, Domingo Esteban has further improved the, the CNNs and, and used better evaluation criteria, including, for example, the forward velocity. But let's have a look at this uh, uh, one in the center here. This one is the, the VFA, the visual foot vision based foothold adaptation, as we call it. So, if the robot is doing a, a step forward in the direction that the user commands, then the robot knows where it's going to step next. And then the neural network is evaluating how good that next foothold is, how safe it is actually. And if it's in a, in a gap, for example, in this particular case here, the, the neural network suggests a better foothold that is safer to, to step on. And in simulation, we can see this works very well. The robot can decide on the fly while walking where to step and where not to step. And if I stop it here, for example, the foot was stepping twice on the same position, and then in the next step, it overcomes two of these gaps because this was just a safer choice uh, compared to uh, stepping inside the gap, of course. So um, there are different uh, evaluation criteria that are used uh, for this in, in um, reality here in the experiment. This works very well. This is a half a meter per second trot. I, I can run this again. The robot makes these corrections on the fly to not step into the gaps. And on the right side, you can see Victor Baraswal, um, who's also co-author of this work, has pulled the robot here and the robot is smart enough not to step into these gaps. And that works on and on. And, even if the velocity changes in between, this gets um, um, embedded into the um, um, expected nominal foothold where it will touch down next. So this is the BFA, which is about foothold adaptation. Now, how about the pose? The foothold adaptation strategies have been um, researched for a while in the last years, but really the pose adaptation has not been investigated much. So here is a nice GIF to illustrate this. Even if you found a very good uh, foothold that is no collisions and it's good, if you're not moving the hip at the same time, if you don't correct the pose of your robot the orientation here, in this case, the pitch, you're not gonna reach this foothold. So it's very important to actually plan those together. And the next work that I'm, the work that I'm presenting here that uh, Shamel has been working on in the last year is exactly about this pose adaptation. So we're proposing here a new paradigm about this pose adaptation. We actually want to uh, find the body pose, the hip heights of each leg individually, so that we can maximize the chance of the robot to reach a safe foothold. Even if it gets disturbed, the robot then has more possibilities around um, the, the, the foothold to, to safely go there. Imagine you're already almost at the joint limits 
and um, you're, you're touching down, but then something happens, there's a disturbance and you're just not able to reach because you're, you're reaching the, the kinematic end limits, uh, joint limits, for example. So if you're in a, in a height where you can maximize this number of safe photos, then you're much more robust for the future. So this is called VITAL, it's the vision-based terrain aware locomotion. And it's based on the robot skills. So on one hand, there's the, the vision-based foot adaptation that I mentioned before, that looks into the foot step, foot, foot placements, and the vision-based pose adaptation, the VPA, that adjusts this height of the, of the, of the hips or the, the, the whole pose, the pitch and roll orientation of the body. And the notion of safety here is, is about, um, um, from the skills that characterize the robot's capabilities. And some of these capabilities are, for example, we want to avoid edges, corner gaps, the, the, the workspace of the leg needs to take in, into consideration. And in general, we want to avoid colliding with the terrain. So moving to the simulation, this here is HiQ, the 90 kilo robot is, is using different velocities. Here, this is a combination of the VFA and the VPA, so the visual foothold adaptation, the visual pose adaptation. And you can see that the pitch gets nicely adjusted as the robot goes up. The same works as well on a 140 kilo high key real robot. Here, even with speeds up to 0.5 meter per second, and what is not shown, 0.75 meter per second, we managed to do this nicely in simulation. The robot is really running over these stairs with the huge weight and, and adjusting the pose as it goes and um, picking the correct footholds. Very preliminary experiment. This is still ongoing work. It's about to be submitted. You can see Haiku is climbing up a step there and then climbing up uh, uh, two steps on, on the right and it's, it's adjusting the pose accordingly. So stay tuned. Um, this will soon be published as well. Um, let's move on to the feasible region. The feasible region is a concept that we've introduced a, a year ago. So if you look at the, the various um, center of mass projection um, um, strategies here, uh, Brettel proposed the support region, which takes into consideration state, static balance and friction. This works on non co planar terrains. And then Orsolino, my former PhD student, proposed a feasible region, which includes also the joint torque limits. They are configuration dependent, as we will see soon. And it's always about this very intuitive evaluation. Is the projection of the center of mass within this region? Yes or no? If it is, then feasible forces, ground reaction forces exist. Uh, this feasible region works both on um, quadrupeds, but also on, on humanoids. And I would like to show you this nice video in which IQ is standing and you see the feasible region in the bottom and we're adding more and more weight on the body. This is a vertical force up to 600 Newton, increasing, increasing. And you see the uh, feasible region is shrinking and shrinking more and more because you're loading the, the, the joint um, the actuators more and more and they're getting closer to their torque limits. So if we're reaching here the limit, we're pushing the robot further to the side. And as soon as it gets out of the feasible region, then you start to see that um, these um, torques are, are violated and you, you, you can't guarantee that this particular um, torque uh, can be executed on the robot. And you can see this with the uh, torque violation flag that is, is going active. So this work was presented last year by, by the Romeo. And um, the PhD student uh, Abdel Rahman uh, Abdo Abdallah, he's working with Michele Focchi together, and, and also Romeo, who made the first version of the feasible region, has extended that to include also external wrenches. So here, for example, the robot is pulling a cart, and also inertial effects are included here so that the robot can do more dynamic motions. I unfortunately don't have time to go much into details here, but I would like to show you um, another part of this new paper here that is can be found on ArcSive um, because there's not just the torque limits but also the kinematic constraints of the of the joints have been added in the high Q because we have these cylinders for example the the, the range of motion in hip and, and knee joints is quite limited it's 120 degrees so if the robot is now moving up and down the body height you see how this reachable region now this, this is based on the kinematic limits is shrinking and growing. So if you're getting close to a kinematic limit, then you're also seeing that the, 
um, center of mass projection, the red point gets very close to the boundary of the region. And if we move the robot very high up already, the, the region is small and then gradually move the robot to the front, the robot base to the front, you see that at some point when we get out of the region, uh, the contact forces can't be controlled anymore and gets un uncontrollable. So if we then combine the feasible region, we intersect that with the reachable region, we get the so-called improved feasible region and the paper is all about this improved feasible region. Here there's a simulation in which the robot is um, using the feasible region to do uh, proper planning. Here it's climbing down a 30 degree slope and it, it has to go very low because there's a tunnel just to make it a bit more difficult just to bring the robot into a more inconvenient uh, pose um, very with a low belly so that the torques are not so high. And you can see more also in the extended abstract that Abdo will present uh, later in this workshop. Okay, very quickly, I have one minute left. This is a mobility enhanced MPC. So here we're using a gate scheduler and the VFA to produce um, um, the, the references. Then there's a nonlinear MPC that uh, Miraj Rathod, um, collaboration with uh, IMT from Luca, has, has developed together with us, with Angelo Brat and Michele Focchi mainly. And this is about um, using the manipulability ellipsoid and including that into the uh, nonlinear MPC to have a better mobility on the feet to guarantee that. And um, we can run this at 25 hertz with a prediction horizon of two seconds. And I would like to skip the simulations, but go straight to the, um, to the experiments. These are some um, initial experiments where we are climbing also over, a, over a, a pallet. On the left side, the robot can use the VFA to adjust the uh, foothold and step up very nicely. And then using the, the pitch, uh, using actually the mobility um, that is part of the, the cost function in the MPC to then uh, change the orientation of the robot. The robot is pitching up. We can see this on the right side. When we push the, the pallet there, the VFA has to immediately ad adapt the next foothold and swing up higher. You can see this on the right front leg. And then while it's actually swinging, it's increasing also the pitch of the robot um, to then increase the mobility once the foot is, is touched down. Um, there's also an extended abstract. Then um, just two more slides. The state estimation for mobile robots is a, is a special issue that I'm, I'm best editing together with my postdoc, Jeff Fink, if you're interested in that. And we're uh, glad to announce that we have uh, funding from the European Space Agency to work together with DFKI in Germany and Airbus in the UK to work on hexapods and quadrupeds that go into uh, challenging terrains on Moon and Mars. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you, Claudio, for your nice presentation. So maybe I can start with my first question. And um, also for the all participants here, you can also raise your hands and I will unmute you so you can ask your question directly. So my question is towards the terrain aware planning that you showed. Now you have a lot of experience over the last years where you show a lot of MPC trajectory optimization going over rough terrain. My question is regarding how do you handle uncertainty coming from the perception side or the state estimation? So you might end up in early touchdown, late touchdown. Do you have special tricks or tools how to handle these events or do you ignore them? What's your call on this? So the early touchdowns, obviously, <clears throat> the, the, what I didn't show is that we use uh, impedance control in the legs. We have uh, a good torque controller and with impedance control, we're, we're certainly safe to accept um, obstacles that come in early. Um, so... The, as far as I know, in the MPC, it, can, it, 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 it is replanning uh, on the fly. This is why it, it has this um, nice fast frequency of 25 hertz. Um, the impedance controller can take care of the initial impacts and then the, the MPC can replan on the fly. So I have a, here a question from the audience. I think that's a question that you get a lot. Very, first of all, very impressive work. Is there a fundamental reason for why you choose hydraulic electric actuators instead of electrical ones? Have you explored pure electric 
and realize that they're not suitable, suitable for heavier robots? Um, we haven't played around with electric uh, robots much, with electric uh, actuation much. Um, the hydraulics are good when you have heavy robots. So the, the, the newest robot is 140 kilos. Um, the hydraulics are very good at tolerating impacts, for example. The hydraulics are nice to cool down because you can sort of, you have a liquid already going through the system and you can cool it wherever you have more space in the trunk. With uh, electric motors, it's a little bit more difficult. I think it's a matter of size. Um, if you, there's, there must be a sweet spot. We don't know exactly what's the weight, but at a certain weight, you probably are better off by, by doing hydraulics. Mm. And the next question is, it seems that in your work, foothold selection and pose adaptation are done in consecutive order. Is it possible to somehow optimize the two of them together at the same time for better overall performance? Um, so, the, the foothold adaptation, they, they're, they're being evaluated together. I mean, your, your, um, the um, division-based pose adaptation evaluates a lot of heights and, and calculates how many safe footholds you have there. So then you're, you're, you're picking the correct height um, that gives you the best possible um, foothold. So they're, they're working in parallel together and the execution is very fast, so I, I think there's no need to, to uh, combine them. And then a personal question for me. Can you elaborate a little bit on your future project with the space exploration? So maybe you can give us some ideas. Will we see a new robot coming up from that project or what is the idea here? So this project is mainly about software. Um, we're using existing robots for that. Um, the, the software is about combining the existing locomotion um, uh, control software that we have in our lab together with the, the navigation stack that the DFKI uh, partner has. And we're going to extend our quadrupedal uh, motion control um, software framework into a hexapod so that it can work on, on both robots. Hopefully next year in, in the workshop, I can give you some uh, first results. Great. So I think we can move on to the next speaker then.